Welcome to the Warrior Gamer Headquarters Podcast. Lieutenant Colonel Ken Crigliano, your co-host. Today we have our very first guest. Hello, I'm John Drozd. I'm a uh, clinical psychologist. I'm a board-certified medical psychologist. I'm a neuroscientist. I'm an Air Force veteran, and before all that, I was a gamer. So I actually played on, not even an Atari 2600, I actually played on the Sears version of that. Um, And I was known in the neighborhood as the pitfall champion. So back in the day, Activision had a program where you would take a Polaroid of your tube TV, and then you would send that in and they would send you certificates and patches. So that's how far sort of my background goes uh, in and with gaming. Um, I met with uh, Josh Otero uh, back in 2020, and that's when Josh was forming the Warrior Gamer Foundation. And so what the Warrior Gamer Foundation does is we bring uh, active duty and veterans and young people of all ages uh, together for intergener- intergenerational gaming and esports competition to promote brain health through community and uh, lifestyle medicine. So JD, that's that's awesome. We are we are ecstatic to have you here, and the intro just really proves on why that you're the guy to be our first guest. And it looks as though like you are like an OG, and you help build this industry and this genre and the culture, right? Well, I was OG before OG, Ken, in terms of that process. So I can show you pictures, you know, at the competitions of uh, when we would all get together and we would be lined up um, playing Space Invaders on Atari 2600 stations. That was that was sort of the original competition, sort of predating what we're doing now in terms of the stadium or stadium events. Bilal, is there like a Hall of Fame? Is there like a esports Hall of Fame yet? Um, not that I know of, but we need to put you on there because I, I remember way back when I was first interested in esports, I would do research on you know, what were the first esports competitions, and Space Invaders one of the things that came up. I can't believe that you're one of them. So <laughs> that's really interesting. Wow, I'm like in I'm in the presence of greatness, I'm standing on your shoulders, man. This is it's pretty awesome. So. How, when when you were doing that, did you predict or just have a feeling or a vision of what it would become? And where are we in the movie right now? Yeah, I mean, I got to tell you that I've dreamed of these days, sort of since COVID. And I'm surprised that it actually, in many ways, I'm surprised that it took it as long as it did. I mean, for so long, I kind of felt like we paralleled UFC. You know, so even any sort of fight fans out there, if you remember the early days of UFC, and it was very much sort of unregulated, sort of wild style. Um, you know, in many corners, uh, gamers have a bad reputation. Some of it mm, relatively well deserved. And when you talk about the culture, um, many of us now are working hard to sort of change the culture to make it more inclusive, uh, make it more supportive of you know gamers across the space um and so we partnered the warrior gamer foundation we're partnered with the rugby foundation and we're very interested in uh integrating sort of the rugby ethos into into our competition into our competitions um to sort of really support and promote uh, both individual excellence as well as community flourishing and so that's where we are kind of going forward Relative to the movie, I mean, I would say we're we're not even at the halfway point. So I'm really, really looking forward to the next 20 years sort of within this space as we develop something really, really special. So when you talk about rugby culture, can you just, for folks who may not know what that is and why it's relevant to this, if you could just help us out, that'd be great. Yeah, so, so really sort of rugby is a sport that on the field of play, I mean, there's an incredible intensity. So you're you're really striving for individual excellence. You're striving for sort of excellence among your team. And you play really, really hard. 
right? You play to sort of win within the space. But as soon as the game ends, there's such massive respect for the warriors on that field. Um, and you see that really the, the best in rugby sort of serve the rest within the space. So one of the greatest teams um, in professional sports history is a team called the All Blacks, uh, which is a rugby team out of New Zealand. And they have a tradition where the MVP of the game stays behind to sort of clean the field and clean the space. And it, it's that sort of commitment to service, right? So we're, we're the greatest really model being something bigger than themselves that we really, really sort of want to promote in the space. So as players develop, as they, you know, achieve sort of recognition, um, fame, that they really sort of use the, their gifts in a way that really serves and improves humanity. And so that's really the ethos that we're looking to bring. And in a space that, again, is really welcoming to, to everyone. So anyone who wants to take the field is going to be welcomed. They're going to be supported. They're going to be nurtured to be the best that, that they can be. And that's something that, that you know, we're, really, we're really proud of and wanting to continue to support. Bilal, do you relate? Uh, yeah, definitely. I'm thinking when you were talking about the rugby example, I was thinking about a lot of the sports that I played growing up. And the one that stood out that wasn't similar to rugby is actually quite different. Uh, basketball. So I played a little bit of basketball every now and then. It's just a very casual hobby of mine. If I just happen to be at a gym, I'll do it. And basketball is a little different because it's a sport that's known for trash talk in fact it's encouraged actually um just look at look anywhere look go, go on instagram and check out ball is life look at youtube look at nick briz even even greats like devante friga you know they'll put a little bit of trash talk devante friga is one of the nice guys he puts some trash talk in his videos too you know, so that's and that kind of attitude, that kind of ego. I mean, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I mean, in some cases, it can be both. In the gaming world, you see a lot of that. It's the same kind of trash talk. The difference is you're behind the screen and the best players, instead of being completely behind the screen, they're now in front of a camera. They're now posting their clips onto YouTube, on the Twitch, on the Twitter. And that goes viral. And that's the attitude. This I'm better than you attitude is something you almost need to have to flourish in the gaming space to be known for your skills. You have to actually show it in that manner. And I think that rugby is definitely a contrast to that where it's more about respect for your opponents and humility. And I think that's definitely needed in the gaming space so that we can promote better role models. Right. And rugby players are trash talkers too, Bilal. You know, we, we put that in the category of, right, psychological operations or sort of psyops, right, in terms of, you know, my daughter. So I love the basketball example. It touches my heart. Um, she played ball through high school, NCAA ball, cut short by COVID, uh, which was really sad. And, and she was one of the best track, uh, trash talkers on the court. Um, but again, the, the way that you do that, right, the way that you engage at the psychological level um, with your competition and the idea around the competition space is that you're essentially sort of matched with equals right and in that capacity right the psychological side is going to give you that edge right it's when really we're talking about the development space you know with some of the gaming platforms when you're you're playing with you know others who are obviously lesser skilled than you where you know in my opinion there's really not a place um, for trash talk in that capacity, that's an ego unregulated. Um, and so, you know, that's something, it's an end both situation, right? Because one of the things that we want to teach within the ethos really comes from a, a book called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And one of the agreements is you don't take anything personally, right? So if someone's trash talking, that's more a reflection of them. And quite frankly, their insecurities than it has anything to do about you as a player. And so, you know, that's one of the ways that sort of we want to frame it for those that we're involved with uh, sort of training and nurturing along. Mm -hmm. And why do you believe that um, 
rugby is the example of when it comes to this sort of ethos like what is it what is unique about rugby that allowed it to cultivate that sort of culture right from from my perspective really is rugby is sort of a global right it, it, it's a global sport um they they really put tremendous effort in terms of the development of their ethos globally and so wherever you play right you know you're sharing sort of that culture amongst players sort of globally um and you know in addition to that arguably it's one of the most brutal sports out there um that requires sort of a, a level of sort of strength and as well as technical skills um that we're really starting to see in many ways interestingly sort of translate into sort of the video gaming space especially as we move and evolve um into more vr competition yeah, I've actually heard that the injuries in rugby are fewer compared to football. People right. actually know how to tackle it, right? Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Oh, wow. And they're wearing a lot less uh, protective gear, too. So that's 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 impressive. So we're joined by April. How are you? Oh, thank you so much. Hi, April. Hello. It's wonderful to see you all. Good to see you. <laughs> So you've uh, you've gotten in in a good spot here because we are uh, we're churning and burning on some good conversations here. So I, I'm, you know, I'm interested in two questions. And Bilal, you got my first one. That's great. The second one is, you know, on our intro episode on our pilot, we talked about cognitive dissonance, where like you're behind a computer. And you really just don't care about the person on the other end, right? And so I, I'm as you're talking, I'm going back in my head because I, I grew up on gaming too. And so um yeah, like there is a there is like this propensity to be like, I just crush these people, like, you know, you know, like forget you, like, you know. Um, but when I'm out on a field. And I helped grow OCR, right? And my company, Legendborn, actually grew up in rugby. That's why we make these real tough stuff. Went to OCR. We need real tough stuff. But that respect in OCR, like, you get done, we're hugging each other. You know, like, hey, man, I love you, man. And I'm just curious on, like, why? What what happened with gaming? Like, why do you think it kind of grew that way? Well, I think it evolved. I mean, really, gaming in so many ways, right, evolved in the wild, right? Early, there, if you look at the early technology of gaming, um, we were all largely separated, right? We all had our, our systems, you know, our Ataris, our Colecos, our Nintendos, our Playstations, um, and it was very disparate. I mean, we had to work. We had to, had to work to get units together to really do anything collectively. And so you saw that sort of individualism sort of in in the early days and to some degree still. Um, so I think that's what's really interesting is you look at the influence of, you know, connecting technologies, right? Internet and speed and real time sort of communication. Um, I think I think that's what we're looking at uh, sociologically as it relates to this intersection of the individual and the collective. Mm. It's very interesting. And within that, just to build on that, Ken, right? So if you think about, right, how you sort of played early on, on, on again, the separate units, there was a lot of engagement in terms of one's own self-talk, right? And so, so many of us learned to motivate ourselves early on in really, really harsh ways, right? We sort of beat ourselves to perform better in terms of that negative sense. We never develop healthier sort of self-talk in that sort of supportive way. And I think also that too started to translate as we started to bring folks together. And again, I know sort of within the early competitions, you you sort of really, really saw those, those alpha dynamics at play. Do you think, you know, like we moved into a, a townhome in Northern Virginia and none of our neighbors, like there's people I see in my life. I've never seen this person in my life. I've been here three years, I've never seen them. And nobody really talks to each other. They just walk outside, they go in their car with, with some exceptions, but I've never experienced that 
And I, I noticed that when there's more people, there's like less interaction. And I, when gaming, do you think the availability of gaming is so universal that we just don't see these people over and over again? So we just kind of like, you know, really don't care about being respectful because probability is going to be 10,000 other people in line. Like, do you think that has something to do with it? Well, I, I'm interested to see sort of, uh, you know, um, April's perspective on it, right? I mean, I think it has to do with this sort of issue of the dehumanization that's happening sort of just culturally at this point in time. Um, and that's something that that we really need to be concerned about and through events like ours, really be facilitating and, and really teaching people sort of healthier interpersonal skills. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I As a researcher, I hearken back to 1972 and Space Wars and Stanford. And that was one of the very first esports experiences. And it came out of some really elite computer programmers going head to head and admittedly trying to bring each other down. <laughs> Their writing shows that this is, we are gonna flex our muscles at this new tech. We are gonna show you what we can do. And we're gonna play a wicked cool game that we just made up doing it. And um, I think the mod culture that has grown from that, that prowess, that technical skill, I think that's one of the things that lead to such passion about these games, um, that people are truly invested in creating these whole spaces for them. So when people are that invested, it and it means so much, the the, the digital space means as, as much as the physical space to many of my my students who are who are on these teams i have one student former student abby spent 10 hours a day practicing rainbow six because he wanted to be the best and he said you know no one will beat me wow. <laughs> and um they grew i mean they built such confidence and such uh ability to communicate with each other because again if you know that game you really have to work as an elite unit to be successful in it so it, i think all of that um that that rigor that they put into learning because it's not and that's one thing people forget they're not just shooting this is not just first person shooter they know exactly how much ammo they need they know exactly who they need to play as they know in a game like league of legends they know ex before the game even starts Choosing who's going to play what and who you're going to block is a huge strategic part. So there's, I think there's just so many different ways to test your metal, as it were, um, that it, it lends itself to that, to that glory seeking and that wondrous uh, feel at the end when you do win and that horrible feel when you do lose. I always say we are, we are training people emotionally to get over stuff quickly and get back on the horse and truly, truly take it by that. Take it. I'm, I'm not going to say the word that's in my head, but <laughs> Like grab it and go for the gusto. I'll put it that way. And to that end, right? To that end, April, and I think this is where sort of Warrior Gamer kind of really comes into play, is we have to establish those developmental playgrounds, right? I mean, I think this is more than anywhere else. This is what the space is sort of missing. And if you go back and you think about, you know, sort of the origin of the community swimming pool, right? To use again, sort of historical metaphor, right? Back in the day, we would all find, you know, a pond or a stream or a lake or whatever, and it would be, you know, Lord of the Flies in sort of that environment, right? It was completely, it was savage, right? I don't know how we made it out alive from that standpoint. And adults came into the picture and said, well, you know, wait a minute, we, we've got to give these kids a safe place to play where they can, you know, sort of learn how to do it in a healthy way and sort of more numbers can kind of make it through. And so then that was the development of, you know, the, the community pools, the recreational centers, um, you know, the tremendous love for the boys and girls clubs and what they provide sort of within our communities. And I think that's what we need and want to do, you know, as the foundation is sort of to, to build those spaces where people can come in wherever they begin they can learn in a safe and protected environment to the point that they can become skilled and then we can teach them right the the, the skills of competition 
which do involve a lot more of the power dynamics and the mind games and all the rest of it. But right now what we're seeing in gaming is that starting on the playgrounds. And I think as a result, right, we're losing tremendous talent at the earliest levels, you know, because of that, that savagery. Yeah. You know, and I've been in and around sports a long time, like athletic sports. And um, I have met a lot of trash talking folks and they can get to the top and, and they can, they can waste everyone in their path, but they don't last their, their flashes in the pan and the folks who go on top, stay on top, break paradigms, like, cause new types of way of thinking in industries are the ones who are the most respectful, humble folks, because you just don't last. I mean, the energy that you just push out is just disruptive to humans and nature and everything. And I, I never, I've never seen them last ever. Well, I think that's why in many ways, you know, we sort of, we're seeing this, the grind culture of game, right? I mean, when we're saying sort of players, I mean, right. I mean, they're past their prime, 22, 23 years old, not only dealing with the physical injuries of, of gaming and, and sort of unhealthy ergonomics, but also the psychological damage, right? I mean, some of the most significant cases that I've seen and treated are of, you know, former gamers who operated at a very high level, whose, whose professional careers were ended too soon because they just operated in, in a constant their entire life was fight or flight mm. they never they never learned how to sort of switch it all and it just led to just this tremendous burnout well Bilal, this is like your calling brother that yeah that's exactly the thing i want to pursue it's the kind of population i want to work with because i realize that this is a problem and it's causing i think a lot of issues with homegrown talent i mean we were just watching worlds i was watching that myself with my friends and if you've been following league of legends worlds you know that the north american talent is just it's not up there and there are a lot of reasons for this but i think um i mean we could go on for the details but when you notice how the talent continuously seems to drop off even when they're at their peak. I mean, you see this player, you think, okay, well, they have talent, they have talent, they have talent. You sign them on North American super team and then they drop. What happened? What happened, right? Now we can talk about, oh, well, the um, the solo queue environment is different in North America. It's not as good. You're not as getting as high quality games. Absolutely, there, that's definitely a factor. But so too is the poor process mentality. I mean, if you look at, say, the Asian esports scene, you know, they understand that they have to work harder than the next person in order to, you know, make waves in the competitive world. But in North America, I notice that there's this sort of complacency, this sort of complacency that comes with uh, this showmanship. And where did this showmanship come from? Like, why did games and showmanship come together? April was talking about the level of skill, the caliber required for some of these games. It does demand a certain mindset, some sort of ego, right? And that, I believe, got catalyzed even further by MLG. So we think about mid-2000s, right? Halo was the big thing. Call of Duty was the big thing. And gamers had to prove themselves that, okay, I am a competitor. I am serious. I am worthy of this money. I need to show what I can do. And unfortunately, you can't show that with these... Um, with your process, you have to show that with your results, you have to show that with clips. And then that became the internet meme for the next, you know, five to seven years, these MLG clips, these highlight reels. And so everything in gaming started to become a highlight reel. And then you had to chase that highlight reel. Eventually, you made it to the top. But you're here while your competition's up here, because they don't care about those highlight reels, they care about consistency. And I think you see these developmental milestones. I mean, we're talking about psychology here. That was a key developmental milestone. And I think that if there was a little bit more guidance back then, that certainly would have put us on the right trajectory towards a process-oriented mindset. But instead, we got a bunch of highlight clips, and that's still dominating today. I think you're absolutely right, Bilal. I mean, in terms of this, and again, it's, it's I think it's, you know, 
I think is a weakness of the Western culture, if I may, right? This sort of this this hyper focus on the technical side at the expense of sort of you know the process and you know some of the more sort of foundational skills of quite frankly nervous system regulation right there's a way through sympathetic parasympathetic branches i don't want to go too far down this neuroscience rabbit hole in this episode maybe in a future episode um right where where the north american players simply lack the capacity to down regulate their nervous systems in a way that will allow sort of the recharge to happen i think that's more than anything you know more than anything else a lot of what we're seeing I'm excited to see, I, I tend to see a reflection of who the culture is. I see like all of that discipline and all of that focus. Our our kids from China and India show that same discipline and focus in their calculus class. <laughs> they show it in their work study job. They show it in their interview for their first jobs. And I'm excited to see what happens in the emerging esports scene that's coming out of India the emerging esports scene that'll be coming out of Saudi Arabia with the, I just put a, a link in the chat for you know five hundred billion dollar mega city about to be built in Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm I'm interested to see. I tend to think our games reflect what we value, and uh, in America right now, and as our esports scene we're growing, we value attention. We are an attention economy. You need views to get your Twitch partnership. You need views to support your Patreons on Patreon. You need, you know, you need views to keep your YouTube channels up. So it becomes half about the gaming and then half about the promotion of yourself and the promotion of your skills here in a way that I think is, um, you know, it's not, not that it's unique to here, but it's, it's very, um, it's very reflective of where we're at right now, I would say. Yeah. So what is that? So actually, I want to go back to a question I had here. Um, are you, JD, are you proposing a sort of like a code of ethics that we might be producing here? Or what are you kind of hinting at? Yeah, we've had discussions. I mean, preliminary discussions with, you know, a number of groups to really almost sort of convey, you know, convene a conference, right? Where we sit and sort of we talk about you know, sort of, again, you know, the ethos of gaming culture, right? The sort of, you know, what is it that we are aspiring to achieve for humanity through this technology? And so, you know, I think the time is, is you know, especially ripe now to, to you know, convene that panel, bring folks together just for the dialogue, right? Just for the discussion, Um because, you know, I don't even know that we have, you know, there's going to be different senses in terms of having the values on the table, but to bring it together and, and to sort of create that consensus conference, um, which then again could be, you know, be used to to really teach. That's where my focus is with sort of the Warrior Gamer Foundation, right? It's really how do we bring, how do we bring young people inclusively? How do we bring young people and communities into this space in the way that's most healthy for them physically, emotionally, socially, right? To sort of build better world. I think T.L. Taylor out of MIT with her AnyKey or AnyKey.org, she's done a lot of work in that space. Um, she started 20 years ago. Um, she has an AnyKey pledge that'll give you an icon on Twitch to show that you have taken a pledge to be to be kind, really, to and to stand up for others if you see them getting getting thrashed, and that I think that work is is growing, and more and more schools are joining, and more and more people are are listening. Um, it's not as wild wild west as it used to be. <laughs> and April, I think that's the absolute. I mean, I think that's the the key important component, right? Like we were talking about earlier, when when you're on a field of relative equals, right? When you, when you walk into the arena because you've earned your place in the arena, that's one thing in terms, of, in terms of the energy that you bring, in terms of the power dynamics at play. That's very, very different than in, say, the proving grounds, right, where we, you know, we want to promote skill. We want to promote 
talent and sort of the bullying and the intimidation and the harassment that is not among equals in terms of skill level, in terms of technology, in terms of other things. I mean, that's where those that are strongest amongst us, you know, I argue really need to step up, want to step up and sort of stop the, you know, the nonsense that's sort of happening at that level, right? You think you can play? All right, let's bring you to an arena where you can play amongst your peers. That's where you can sort of match. That's where you can trash talk, but not, not in these sort of community spaces. There's a, there's a time and a place, and that's often not not here. Yeah, in our in our trash talk part of this, um, I do remember. Yeah, I love I I talk so much trash. Like I am a smack talking crazy man, and but I do it because I love that person, and I know what they could be capable of, and that my my point in doing it is to grow the sport, grow the person, not an ego fill. And so I totally agree with you that there's levels, right? When you show up and you're, and you're a made woman or a made man, right? Like there is a respect there that even if you get owned, like they're like, no, this person made it there. So I totally, totally understand what you're getting there there. Michael Jordan said very similar things. He is a notorious trash talker. And he said, you know, I have to because I want the best out of everybody around me. I want the best in practice. I want the best in games. I want the best walking down the street. <laughs> and uh, he, he, it was like his civic duty to trash talk people. <laughs> yeah, you got to have a strong, you got to have a lot of self-respect and confidence to take trash talk, even from a loving like so i think that there is a a uh I, I think the code of ethics thing is very it is very interesting to me because i didn't have a code of ethics when i was a kid uh you know i was very i was not there was a time period in my life it was not good right it was didn't have a home i, I just it was awful i joined the military to get a code of ethics right to to get integrity to get character and my recruiter told me that you know i was a parasite and you know i needed to earn my place in life and it was totally accurate it's my best friend to this day but so do you think that gaming might be sort of like a path that one could take to grow themselves and to create an identity and to build character yeah april do you want to speak to that I, I was I was waiting for you because I know you've got the, the view, but a hundred percent. I've seen it happen for the past fifteen years. I've seen introverts come out of their shell. I've seen people begin working together in ways that they were completely isolated before, but now they feel they have a family, especially games like World of Warcraft and games that are always on, games that you have, you play with the same people over and over and over again and you get to know them. There, It's such a huge part of everyday life this for this generation that it, you just really can't separate their social, their social component of life from their gaming. And it's it really does grow, folks. My my, I would put my esports guys up against anybody for how fast they think, how <laughs> how creative they are, how confident they are. Um, they and they give back. You know, they they are so solid. They're just um, amazing. And these are again at the collegiate level. I'm at the collegiate level, so these are kids who are also like Bilal in school still, also doing very hard degrees in engineering and you know, computer science and, and still they make time for their gaming community and they bring people together in ways that I don't think ha happened in the past, you know, cause it's, it goes beyond distance. Like some of these kids have their best friends are in Brazil and they play VR boxing games with them every weekend. <laughs> and so it's, it's just, an, and they start businesses together. You know, there we were, I was just with a, a, a student this morning who started his own business around esports, around managing tournaments. And he's now he's looking to give back and do, you know, he's so successful. He's looking to give back. So it, it truly does grow people. I think. And we socialize as we play. And this is the, the piece that has really sort of been, been, I don't know, it's been absent for the past sort of several years, right? Everything we need to know, right? We learned in kindergarten. 
And hopefully that kindergarten was a really sort of healthy, supportive place, not for all of us. Right. Some of us, you know, can, like you said, I mean, we learned in the military. Many of us learned to play. Right. A lot of the I call them the lost, you know, lost boys and girls. Right. Were found and learned to play in healthy ways within the structure and support of the military center. Again, go back to the Boys and Girls Club. Right. And, and, and sort of their mission and how, you know, they are involved in, in the socialization of good humans. Why? Because they have rules of engagement on the playground. And, and that's where you learn sort of good sort of citizenship and support. So I think we have tremendous, tremendous global opportunities, global opportunities um, to promote social, emotional interactions and well-being um, through the games we play and how we play those games. So um, we have to wrap it up here soon, but I want to hit on one last topic here which is um uh my friend brendan he actually is a sponsor of warrior game foundation he, he's a um he heads up the transcend foundation and he's very kind to help enable us our veterans day event with a donation from his foundation which is fantastic but he said ken you need to look at you need to read this book called the rise of superman well that was only like two days ago and i'm i'm three quarters or 80 percent of the way through there is a section in there that's very interesting, and it talks about flow. And raise your hand if you don't know what flow means. Okay, good. Everyone does. So flow for the folks out there really means be in an alpha state, be totally focused in the zone is another phrase that people describe it. And uh, the the book covers a section on gaming, on how gamers enter in and out of the flow state more easily than anybody else and so extreme athletes like they jump off of buildings like i'm an i'm an extreme athlete like i do crazy stuff um we do those things to get into this flow state and it was really interesting to hear that at timing because you know it was in between our podcast so i'm very interested jd balal april in your comments on achieving a flow state through gaming and how that helps you in the rest of your life, you know, how the impact of it. So go ahead, JD. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. There are, in my opinion, through advances in technology, we have the ability to teach and, you know, support flow states at earlier and earlier ages. And we're really, and this is a whole nother episode in terms of the neuroscience of flow and gaming, right? You know, we're talking about that left prefrontal cortex, right? That's where flow lives in that sort of in that world and in that space. And my opinion, there are few things, there are few things better than gaming taught well, gaming taught well that sort of take folks into that. And once you know it, once you know flow, then your neurons that fire together, wire together. So once you know it, you can begin to generalize that into what Simon Sinek refers to as the infinite game of life. And so, yeah, I think that's a whole future. And, and we're a gamer, we're in the process, you know, with Janelle McCauley and other folks are really developing programs to promote uh, that flow state training that incorporates really it's a sort of the integration of virtual and real world experiences so people can really sort of see how sort of you know swimming with the dolphins in in vr translates to sort of swimming with the dolphins in life yes i think this warrants a whole nother episode yeah, I really do think this is a very detailed topic, and I think it's coming more and more in the mainstream. How can people focus? I mean, we were talking about, April, you spoke about uh, attention economy. Attention economy meaning that you need something eye-catching, something immediate to grab your attention. But have you noticed that in the process of developing this attention economy, we ironically but yet not ironically at the same time, lost our attention span, lost our ability to focus. It's actually quite bad. 
actually, just how much we're unable to. And the most popular social media platform, I believe, is TikTok, I want to say. But I tried surfing on the app a few times, and I noticed how they catch you immediately with their zoomed in cameras and their subtitles and their attractive thumbnails of whatever it is they're doing. I'm thinking, if I don't like this immediately, I'm just going to swipe to the next. And that's how they get you. And now you're scrolling nonstop. But these flow states are the exact opposite. It's I'm here and I'm going to focus on this. Once I'm out, I can do whatever else. And I believe gaming for me kept that ability intact. I notice when I study, I study. When I'm gaming, I'm gaming. I'm not on my phone with social media. I could care less about that. Do I want to watch a YouTube video on Hades? I've been playing a lot of Hades recently. Great game. Yes, I do want to watch a YouTube video on that. But my work comes first. And I can switch between that. I can use my study break for Hades. And I can study when I'm studying, the Hades goes away. And like that's my favorite game right now. I have, have like how many 35 plus hours on it? I've only been playing it for a week. So I've been playing it a lot. Okay, last week was an easy week. That's why I had all this time. But why am I able to switch so quickly? It comes from the gaming. Right. The neurons so, are fired. Yeah, the neurons yeah, you, are fired. Wire. Team, I have to go because I got a, I got a patient waiting now. I <laughs> want to continue the conversation. So happy to see you all. Let's kind of keep this going and just uh, just gratitude and thanks. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank thanks you. for joining. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. I would add that flow is perfect. It's the perfect thing to be developing in the virtual space. Because unlike basketball, the you know basketball, you know how big the court is, you know how high the ball, you know how it's set, you know how high the rim is. In gaming, it changes. There's there's never anything that you can count on being the same. The publishers are constantly putting the putting the pushing the limit on testing people's skill and pushing the limit on how what's your twitch speed what's your reflex what how many characters have you memorized how many pairs of character do you know what will work best together there, there's just such depth to gaming in all different in all the different forms of gaming not just not just the first person shooters but like even hearthstone and valorant right now is huge we had more people sign for valorant than anything else and i think the fact that there are they're being challenged. They're not signing up for easy games. They're not playing Fruit Ninja. <laughs> They're playing <laughs> games. <laughs> They're I heard like, that's a good game. I know, right? No offense to Fruit Ninja. They're <laughs> 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 playing games with complexity and with that create a landscape where they can prove their skills. Again, think the smartest people in the school. Think the most competitive. Think people who are really excited to show what they can do. That's why they practice 10 hours a day. When That's why you had 35 hours of your week gone, I bet, Bilal. Yeah. <laughs> because you want to get better. You want to prove yourself. And that is, flow is the point of life, in my opinion. Finding what gives you that level of energy where you don't even feel time going by. Finding what makes you tick and what makes you wake up excited to pick up what you where you've left off and try to get this next level and try to, you know, try to outdo your friends. That's a that's a definite part of it. So I think this is we're definitely like I said last time we were talking, Ken, we are training people to think. We're training people to compete. We're training people to get over loss and get back on it. And I mean, we are creating a super, a, a super generation of thinkers. I, I bet if some at some point people are going to measure the neural pathways that were created in our gamers <laughs> compared to, you know, those that are folks who don't game and they'll see, I imagine, a big difference, just like language learners and people who play musical instruments and people who are truly repetitively exercising their brain in new and unique ways all the time. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's coming. And uh, I actually just sent out a um, National Science Foundation solicitation on not new and novel ways to, you know, measure health and wellness and everything. And I, I sent it to my, um, my university leads uh, on my company that I run. So I'm like, man, there's 12 million bucks. To... Yeah, I know it was, it was pretty cool, but I, I think you're, you're totally on it because, you know, when I had my brain injury, 
Yeah, I was I was so thankful that I was an athlete. I knew how to body work. I knew about training and, you know, like, blah, like, you know, you got to watch videos. You got to watch the best people do it, emulate them, improve it, make it work for you. And I was like, this is easy. I can come back from this. And I gamed my butt off, man. I actually had my insurance company buy me an Xbox Connect. And I got all the brain body games and everything. And I tell people, I swear to God, if it wasn't for that, you know, I'd be I'd still want to be able to walk. And I think measuring that is just inevitable. Like we're going to optimize some people this way. I think is really cool. And I think there's room for even like people going through breast cancer, gaming can help them get in the right position. Each time you have to hit a mark and hold your breath. And there are specific movements that you need to make what's happening in the medical field valuable per person so as we come to personalized medicine i you know i talk about my friend sam all the time there's so many applications for gaming to not only physical rehab but teaching people how to how to move and be still for these actual treatments for radiation for all of the other treatments that go along with recovery i think there's room for gaming and just you know i know i'm biased i know (laughs) but i think there's room for gaming absolutely everywhere and uh, there's, you know, there's no reason not to make it, make it a challenge and keep people engaged and give them a chance to get in flow and have fun and, you know, bring others in and it fights isolation. It improves communication. It improves leadership and confidence. There's, there's just so many pluses. So real, real quick, Bilal, this is both of you actually. So, you know, I, I cracked on my dad on the, uh, the intro episode and he actually watched it and uh was like i can't believe you said that about me on worldwide and i said well dad i'm just you know just engaging the audience etc and and he goes like i actually really liked it it was really informative i watched it three times and i was like really and he goes so my dad has a he experienced a stroke a, a couple times and he was at one point in really bad shape and um, he goes, do you think gaming can help me? And I was like, yeah, I do, dad. And he goes, well, how do I start? How do I begin? And I said, well, just go on the app store on your phone. And I, I bought him a really nice iPad, too. I said, go go there and search for like speech therapy games and just download a, a bunch and just play them. And if you don't like them, you just find the one that works for you. And he calls me like two days later and he goes, I played 90 minutes and I feel like I ran a marathon. And he spoke clearly with no stuttering for the first time in like two years. And now he's downloaded some other games and he's playing brain games and everything. So um, I'm, I am convinced and I'm so happy. And I hope that someone listening to this will be like, Oh, I wonder if that can help me and in, in initiate. So both of you, I appreciate if it wouldn't, wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you guys. So already we checked the box that we're, we um, improve someone's life. Nice. That's incredible. Oh, yeah. Tell him, thank you. You're making me tear up over here. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, he will watch this. I, I, he, he's, he's told me he's, he's hooked. So Okay, any saved uh, save rounds? Any last parting words? Well, I mean, we've brushed upon quite a few topics. We 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 started by talking about gaming as it pertains to mental health, and then we semi transitioned to the discussions of flow states and health. So these are big topics for another podcast so if anybody is watching listening if that interests you stick around for future episodes because that's exactly what we're going to talk about and i would just add that there is an element i mean we always say you know get together but at at some point and when you're at a point in your life where you really do not want to see anybody or talk to anybody your gaming can be such good company and you charge you challenge yourself you challenge yourself to get a higher score you challenge yourself to solve more you know to solve more to do more to play more and i think that 
you know, learning to be with yourself is really augmented by the VR games, particularly, and some of the other games that are that are so readily available mobile on mobily now. I think that's going to be our next, uh, you know, we're, our next challenge will be to, you know, let people feel good about being with themselves <laughs> and saying that, you know, it's not a, it's not a crime to be, to spend, you know, 30 hours on your own having fun. You get to do that. And I think this culture and this, uh, this population and this community, particularly the military guys who are, who do spend a lot of time alone many, many times um, as they're, you know, coming home and dealing with, you know, dealing with separation issues, and family issues, you know, finding something that makes that alone time really enjoyable is, I, I think it's so, per, so, per, so important and so pertinent to a happy life. Great. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you at a later episode.